Hi, and welcome to another episode of Hacking History. I'll start this video off with a simple question. In what year do you think the first computer virus was discovered? I'll let the intro roll as you think about the answer. So I'm guessing many of you estimated somewhere around the mid-90s. After all, this is when we first started connecting to the internet, right? Well, if you answered this, then you are actually incorrect. The first accepted computer virus made its appearance in 1971. That's probably before anybody watching this video was even born. And you might even be wondering, did they even have computers and the internet back then? Well, the short answer is yes, but it's a little more complicated. This story also has very close ties to what's known as the first email. So come with me through this history lesson as we dive into the story of the first computer virus. Early computers within this era were not personalized at all and were incredibly different to what we have now. They were often massive, consuming entire rooms and were overwhelming just to look at. These relics of computing past is what's known as mainframes. And this is long before the days of servers, desktops, laptops, and smartphones. These were highly specialized niche tools that only a few of the best minds had access to. Interacting with these computers was often done by a few primitive methods, such as feeding a punch card which had machine instructions on it, or viewing a panel of lights which would indicate what the system would be doing. Often these correlated with on and off bit values. This is what was known as a monitor. And then there was also teletypes. This is kind of like how a modern terminal would operate, but you'd use a electronic typewriter-like device, which would physically print on paper. And then there was the ARPANET. This is widely regarded as the precursor to the modern internet, but gaining access was not as simple as grabbing a modem or connecting to a Wi-Fi hotspot. The ARPANET was originally founded by the Department of Defense, and only universities were able to connect to it. As computers back in those days were fairly exclusive and expensive, having an ARPANET connection on top of that would only push the costs higher, let alone the space requirements. The ARPANET also had strict guidelines as to what was and was not allowed. Unlike today, computers used to be time-shared. Anyone who grew up in the 90s would understand having a designated computer time which you could use to play your favourite educational game for half an hour during school time. This was the same for computer users back in the 1970s. Programmers only had an allocated time to use their computer before it became somebody else's turn. Contrasting to today, with some programmers sporting multiple computers on one desk. A neat little feature back on these systems was the ability to send messages to other users on the computer, which could then be received when it was their time to use it. But this feature lacked the ability to send messages to other computers. That was until Ray Tomlinson came into the picture. Ray was working as a computer programmer at BBN, which is now known as Raytheon. Ray was a passionate developer and had some creative ideas for his time. Specifically, he wrote two programs for the 10x operating system, which was the operating system that was mainly used on mainframes at the time. These programs were CopyNet, which was used to copy files to other computers via the ARPANET, similar to what we know as FTP today. And then there was SendMessage, which was capable of sending messages to other terminals via the ARPANET, not just to other users on the same machine. This simple idea would pave the way for email later in the future. Ray, not knowing the impact he'd have on the world, was pretty unfazed by his creation at the time. Now, I'm often asked, did I know what I was doing? And the answer is, yeah, I knew exactly what I was doing. I just had no notion whatsoever of what the ultimate impact would be. So much to the point where he cannot even remember what he wrote in what's regarded as the world's first email but guesses it was probably along the lines of QWERTY OP. He also transformed the way we use the ACK character. Earlier on, it used to indicate the price of goods. For example, 5 kilos of rice at $1 a kilo. He thought this character would make sense and used it as a way to address a user at a terminal. Initially, he accomplished all this as side projects without the knowledge of his employer. He'd say to his colleagues, don't tell anybody, this isn't what I'm supposed to be working on, after showing them what he had built. Quick pause. What was the silly name you used for your first email address? Give us a laugh and leave them in the comments below. 
Ray had a colleague named Robert H. Thomas, otherwise known as Bob. Bob was another developer for the 10X operating system, also working at BBN, and had wanted to conceptualize the idea of a mobile application. This was an application that could move from one system to another via the ARPANET. As a proof of concept, Bob created an application he called the Creeper. This program would send the following message to the attached teletype. I'm the Creeper, catch me if you can. Before moving to another computer to do the same thing. This would cause a minor disruption as it would happen at random times, even when other people were trying to use the machine. While a bit annoying, the Creeper was limited to only two functions print the message and move to another computer to do the same thing. It didn't self-replicate like a virus or worm. That was until, once again, Ray Tomlinson came into the picture. For nothing more than a bit of fun, Ray combined the code from the Creeper along with the code he wrote for both SendMessage and CopyNet, which would give it the ability to become self-replicating and move freely around the ARPANET. And it's at this point where the program was labelled the first computer virus. Imagine walking into your 1970s computer lab drinking your 1970s coffee and your 1970s business attire to check your 1970s computer output to see a message saying, I'm the creeper, catch me if you can. Naturally, you'd be a bit confused and asked if anybody had printed it. You'd be further confused when nobody would own up to it and even maybe madly accusing your colleagues of playing pranks. The virus would plague users of the 10X operating system who were connected to the ARPANET frequently printing this message while users were trying to get their work done, causing a bit of a hit to productivity, or at least just a bit of an annoyance. However, those who endured this first virus should be thankful that the virus was only a prank and would only print that message, nothing more. It would not try to do anything dodgy like trying to steal a credit card number, which weren't really a thing back then anyway. By 1972, the spread of the virus was likely to have infected every 10x system connected to the ARPANET, making it one of the most successful cyber incidents of all time, nearly a 100% infection rate. In raw numbers, this virus is estimated to have affected a grand total of 15 computers, likely a monumental number for the time. By this point, the virus had copied itself so many times that it was starting to affect how systems would operate crowding out other programs and preventing them from running properly. However, in an interesting twist, the techniques learned from the development of the Creeper were then later used in the Macross system, which stands for Multi-Computer Route-Oriented Simulation System, which was an air traffic simulator. Using this technique, it would allow parts of the simulation to move across the network. The Creeper had been on the loose for about a year, with the disruption appearing all over the ARPANET and starting to cause more serious problems. This was all about to change as the first antivirus software was about to be released. The software would work quite similar to the way the Creeper works. It would spread through the ARPANET and look for the Creeper program and deleting it once it was found. This was appropriately named as the Reaper and was developed by none other than Ray Tomlinson himself. It's likely that the Creeper caused so much disruption, Ray was put in a position where he had to find a way to remove it. Especially that access guidelines for the ARPANET were extremely strict at the time. Though I can't find any source as to Ray's motivation for writing the Reaper, but it sure is nice if other developers of malware followed in his footsteps. While the Creeper was nothing more than a technical demonstration mixed with a bit of a prank, it's interesting to see where the concept evolved. I don't think Robert or Ray had any idea what path the future would take. I mean, sometimes it was such a simple thing to do at the time, but it, does, it has had ramifications through many people's lives. Standing on their shoulders, a lot of software has been developed which brought a revolution to our world, but has also picked up some of the problematic parts too. I wonder if they had any idea where their ideas would lead us 50 years later. Well, one thing is for sure, and that's that we'll continue to explore more of the history of computing, hacking, and cybercrime right here on the channel. So make sure you're subscribed with notifications on so you won't miss it. Anyway, this has been Jason from JasonSec. If you enjoyed the video, please leave it a like, it really helps me out. Share this video as well to somebody who you think might enjoy it, and I'll catch you on the next one.